Hi guys, Daniel Spatz again from California. Daniel Spatz interviews today in English. I have a very special guest, Virginia Ruchisi from Romania. She was a former uh, star, tennis star in the 80s, 70s. Uh, French Open champion in 1978, finalist in 1980. She lost to Chris Sever. So I'm trying to, to connect with my guest. Um, uh, no, I, I just want to see my... <laughs> my uh, thank you, Munich Life. I want to see my guest right now. Uh, uh, so let's see if she connects with um, me, Virginia, a big time player. I won 12 single titles, 16 doubles titles. So if you go to Wikipedia, Mirta, como estás? If you go to Wikipedia, uh, you will. Uh, see how good she was. She played uh, uh, amazing, won 12 singles titles, 16 doubles titles. Uh, so amazing, amazing. So um, I love to learn from, from great players. Uh, please don't make any promotion now in my, in my life. Thank you so much. This is an interview, not a promotional thing. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, Virginia is not there yet. Oh, she's the invitation. So you can, you can accept, you can go live oh with me. My. Oh, there you go. Can you hear me? Oh, I'm so happy. Absolutely perfect. <laughs> I have oh, I have the right. tennis ball again. <laughs> I was panicked. I'm How are you doing? Well. I'm okay. How are Thank you? Thank you at home. Uh, finished watching the Australian Open on, on TV, uh, which kept me busy. And uh, it was wonderful uh, to see uh, because we had fantastic matches, both uh, men and women. So I enjoyed it a lot. Francesco Cancellotti ah, saying auguri Francesco, tanti auguri anche per te. Thank you. How many languages you speak? Well, I, I don't speak as many as you might think. I only speak English, French, of course, Romanian, and uh, some Italian. I don't speak Spanish, so, so sorry about that. <laughs> no, you don't have to be sorry. I have to adapt. And, and speak English. So thank you so much for accepting thank you to the you. invitation to talk. Really, I haven't uh, done an interview in a long time, so I'm a little bit nervous, but uh, you make things so much easier that I know, you know, I'm going to relax in a, in a couple of minutes. Uh, I, I bet, oh, I'm talking about relaxing, how nervous Do you remember how nervous you were before the French, the first French Open? Uh, yes, uh, yes, I was nervous because I put pressure on myself and because it was the first time I was in a final of a Grand Slam and uh, uh, Roland Garros has always been for me um, the one that I thought I could do the best in. And so I was really uh, nervous, uh, playing also me, my Jaušovets, who was my doubles partner, in fact. And also lucky that Chris Everett didn't play the tournament that year because, you know, in my career, I lost something like 22 times to Chris Everett, to tell you the truth. <laughs> But at least I played her 22 times. You know, I, I, I'm proud of having uh, the opportunity to play her 22 times. Uh, so which means that we played a lot in the semifinals, in the quarters, uh, and also a few, uh, a few finals. Like in the Italian Open and uh, another final that I played against her at the French Open in 1980, uh, which I lost to her badly. Um, so, yes, uh, yeah, I'm pretty proud of my career, although, you know, you always want more. And I know I could have done more, but it could have been also worse. What made, uh, we're going to go random, you know, I don't have a script in my interviews yes. for you to know. It's a conversation. Right. It's a conversation. 
So why, what made Chris Evers so difficult to beat? Why, what described her game and how you felt across yes, the net? First of all, I you know had a her. lot of respect for her uh, because um, I came late uh, outside Romania for the first time when I went to the States, I was 19 already. And the first time I kind of played the French Open, I was 18, 19. And before that, I never had the chance to, uh, to, to, to meet her. We, we were never sent to play juniors uh, in those days, like they do today. They play juniors at 14, 16, and so. I remember I only played one year when I was already 18. I played uh, Roland Garros and Wimbledon in juniors, but I was not interested anymore in juniors. Already my mind was set up for, for doing well uh, with the big ones. Uh, so coming late and seeing her on TV, um, although in Romania we only had Wimbledon, and particularly the Wimbledon finals, um, nothing else. Uh, for me, uh, her name was huge, uh, not only hers, uh, of course, a few others, but she, you know, kind of stuck into my head and I had so much respect for her that probably because of that, I was uh, much more intimidated by Chris Ebert than any other player. Uh, Martina Navratilova also um, was a, a tough, tough opponent for me, but I knew her uh, since she was uh, 17, 18, because uh, we met in countries like Czechoslovakia, uh, in Prague, I remember we had a tournament. We also had a tournament in Kiev, and I remember in Kiev I played the finals against her, uh, and she beat me 13-11 in the third. And so with Martina, I met more often in the uh, Eastern European countries, also in East Germany. These were the countries where, you know, we had access uh, in those days. And finally, finally, Virginia, when I was uh, 19, yeah. Mariana Simeonescu and I, Mariana Simeonescu, who became Mrs. Borg later on, were uh, lucky to get an invitation to play the Virginia Slims uh, tournament circuit, uh, thanks to Ili Nastase and his uh, manager. Uh, because they were, uh, Ili was already so well known and was playing all over the world. And once they were in Boston and, uh, at a tournament for the men, and they happened to be at the bar later on in the evening, next to Edie McGoldrick, and uh, her ma his manager was pushing Ili to ask uh, Edi McGoldrick to invite Mariana Simeonescu and myself to play in the States, the Virginia Slims uh, Championship. And believe it or not, it happened. Uh, Ili asked her, and a few months uh, later, we found ourselves with an invitation at the Romanian Federation. And that's how, how we started, with zero dollars in the pocket, really zero dollars no so no 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 sponsors no sponsors the federation <clears throat> did not have any money to to give us so micho prea was the name of Ili's manager we only had a ticket uh, a flight ticket from bucharest to new york new york to san francisco because we started in san francisco and back and back to romania that's all we had in those days we mm. received a uh, hospitality with the tournament. Uh, they used to put us in some houses with, with people that wanted to have tennis players as guests during the tournament. And so um, Micho Prea, the manager of Ili, waited for us at the airport, you know, and, and for two days, uh, we spent uh, two days with him in New York. And then I remember he was not a rich man at all. He gave us $200, so we, we had $200 for $200. both of us. Each one had $100. And we took the flight from uh, New York to San Francisco. And, and there we played our first tournament in the States. And uh, well, and, and we started winning a little bit and making a little bit of money. 
So you didn't, you no, didn't have no, a coach? No, we did not live anything. with together with a coach. We were alone. Uh, we had coaches in Romania, of course. Yeah. But uh, for trips like this, yeah. I think there were no money. Yeah. So that's how we started. Yeah. One of, uh, Virginia, sorry, one of the, your compatriots, yes. I mean, Jon Tiriak, he was one of the first traveling yes. coaches. Right? And he was he my manager with later on. Uh, he became my manager when I, well, started to to win a little bit more. I remember the first time I asked him to be my manager was in New York. I reached the quarterfinals at uh, Forest Hills and I had gathered something mm -hmm. like $20,000. <laughs> so I didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> so <laughs> it was a lot, was, a was lot, a lot of money. Yes. And, uh, I went to Jon and I said, Jon, I have $20,000 and I don't know how to do, what to do is it, how to manage all this, you know? So he said, yeah, uh, give them to me and I will take care of it. So uh, he took care of it. <laughs> he opened an account for me how about, or something. How about, I was, Virginia, I how old you were? Sorry, how old? was 19? about 20-ish, something like that. It's, uh, I think it was 20. in 77, okay. 76. Okay. Um, and uh, yes, because in okay. 78, I think uh, Flashing Meadows started. So we moved from Forest Hills to Flashing Meadows. Exactly, seven years. After the, the, last, the last Forest Hills was uh, 97 when Vegas yes. won. Okay, 90, no, 87. No, 77. No, no, uh, Villas won in 1977. 1977. Yes, exactly. I remember I saw that. I saw that match. Yeah. And um, so they have to, they have to make, sorry, they have to make the court faster <laughs> for Jimmy Connors. <laughs> well, that's the way it goes. You know, in France, we have slow uh, clay courts, uh, probably the slowest ones. And in Germany, too, they are pretty slow, the clay courts. But unfortunately, today we don't have so many mm -hmm. tournaments on clay. Uh, the majority are on hard courts and indoors and outdoors and yeah. that's why so many injuries I think you know yeah uh, yeah so good anyway point. Good I point. let you start questioning <laughs> no it's perfect it's a pleasure listening and learning uh, the question goes to back to your childhood yes. I'm gonna take you back why you started playing tennis how old you were and and also also, um, who well, I introduced you to tennis? Well, I a funny story, you know. Um, listen, my father was a professional uh, football player, soccer player, right, for America. Yes, and he nice. played for uh, professional. Uh, one of the best clubs in Bucharest, Rapid Bucharest. Sorry, Christina, uh, Virginia, sorry. Someone is uh, saying hi in, Ruma in Romania, I think. Uh, hi. Uh, if you want to say, I don't, Who is that? <laughs> I don't understand. This is why. Oh, is so, someone wrote uh, a message Adrian, in as a Romana, saying Adrian hi to you. Lopez. Oh, okay. No, in the I top, see Cornel. The Cornel. Ah, Cornel, Sat wait a minute. Ah. Cornel, I don't know, only Cornel I can see. Anyway, hi to him. Hi, it's Beth. okay. That's okay. Nice. Don't worry. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so I was telling you that my father was a good soccer player, professional, until he uh, hurt his knee badly, had an operation, and uh, finally he had to move to another club in Transylvania, and that's where I was born, uh, in, a, in, a, in a village where they had a pretty good team, where he could, you know, still perform pretty well, and... Uh, we uh, lived there until I was 10. But uh, we lived next to a small tennis club, which had two courts, two clay courts. And I was passing by these tennis clubs all the time, every single day. I was just coming out of my house and the courts were like, you know, uh, uh, not even five minutes walk. And, um, but I never went. I never went to, to the tennis courts to play. And so I was rather playing soccer with the boys in the street. And uh, I was then eight 
eight years old. And all of a sudden, this gentleman is knocking on, on, on my shoulder and he says, you. So I said, yeah. So you, don't you want to come and play tennis at the club? And I go, tennis? Uh, so I said, yeah, why not? Why not? We were in the summer holidays. <laughs> summer holidays uh, from school. And I go, yeah, why not? And he goes, tomorrow morning, uh, come over at nine o'clock. So uh, this gentleman was uh, the owner of the club and the coach, the main, the main coach of the club. He had a few, he had a few good players. And, but he, so I came there and he put me at the wall because that's how we started in Romania and many other countries in those days. Gave me a, an old racket with broken strings almost. And he said, hit the wall, uh, the wall. And I hit the wall. I probably managed. I don't remember exactly how, how I did. But he says, don't you, don't you want to come uh, every morning during the summer? So I said, yeah, why not? So this is how I started tennis, basically. Uh, this little wow. club in Transylvania. Wow. And uh, during the summer, I went almost every day. So I trained there for like three months. And then my father finished his career. And, and uh, three months after this meet, uh, we decided, the family, to go back to Bucharest. So, and, excuse me, yeah. mom, dad, no, and don't. you, you have siblings? Child. Yes. So, you are the only, so only we child. Went back well, you were the only child. And for, actually, I was eight when this happened. The for, but for two years, I did not play tennis. Mm. Uh, no, my parents oh. uh, had some friends and one of them was, uh, was a coach for diving, <laughs> diving into the water. <laughs> so they all thought that I had a lot of energy to spend, mm. you know. So she tells my mother, do you want, don't you want to send your daughter to, to me, and, you know, to, to see how it goes? And I tell you, I could not dive even from one meter with my head down. I cannot, I cannot dive even <laughs> today in the, in the water. And so I was so bad. And one day my mother came to see me and she had pity for me, seeing me in the water and though and not, you know, not liking it. So she says, listen, yeah. don't you want, actually, I was having a lot of energy. That's why everybody wanted to kind of put me to sports, you know. And so my mother tells me, listen, how about if you quit? So I go, yes, I was the happiest kid in the world. And then uh, she also had the idea to put me back to tennis. So we found out which was the closest club to our house and found found out who was the uh, person to contact. And so one day she took me to the club. It was the Dynamo Club, which is a multi-sports club. Dynamo. And that's where I started tennis with uh, Mr. Segarciano, who was uh, my first coach. My, I mean, I cannot consider that uh, my uh, adventure in, uh, in Transylvania for, for three months was you know, uh, the one that put me on the, on the right track, but still it was initiating me to tennis. And then after two years of not doing anything, going to the Dynamo Club with uh, the coach uh, Segarciano was really uh, the start of my career. Fantastic. Do you, do you study privately oh, or the group section, sessions? sessions? And some... Yeah, and also privately. Group sessions. Also privately. How do you how how was the how the coaches work back then? I mean, uh, now you have the colorful balls, the small nets, the small rackets for kids, all well, different, uh, well, you know, elements equipment. Well, the, how was, the how was it like to learn tennis was, then? Uh, wooden rackets, of course. I mean, the club could. Yeah, the uh, heavy, heavy. Right? Heavy, heavy. Heavy? No, small? normal. Normal rackets. Normal rackets. We did not normal have rackets racket. for kids. Normal rackets. And I remember uh, we, I don't know how the club got equipped with Schlesinger rackets. 
uh, so my first racket was a Schlesinger racket. Uh, later on, I preferred other rackets, uh, like Dunlop, and I also had Rossignol, and I ended up my career with head. But coming back uh, to that uh, period, um, yeah, I, Mariana Simeonescu was at the same club, and Florenza Mihai, and a few other good players for Romania, and we trained together. So we had a good competition between, our, between ourselves. And I think that's what made us, you know, grow. And we were all very ambitious. You know, Florenta mm. Mihai was in the finals so of Roland Garros also in 1977. And Mariana Simeonescu won the juniors. Uh, after that, after that yes. you know, her career stopped at one point, you know, particularly when she married Borg and, you know, she preferred to quit. So, uh, yeah, that's how, how I started. Okay. So, so uh, and <laughs> yes. you mentioned yes. Bjorn Borg, right? Yes. Big, big, one of the biggest tennis figures in the history, legend. I bet you have the, you had the chance to of meet course, him, right? Of to, course, to, we were, to we know were friends with Bjorn. How was, how was him? We all know him inside the court, like Iceman, oh, yes, you know? yes, yes, Cold yes. mind, Zen master, quick, quick, the quicker, the fastest. But how was Bjorn outside, of, outside the court, of the court? Well, Bjorn was a little shy, uh, polite, um, but I cannot say that uh, we like went out uh, uh, for discotheques and, and dinners and stuff like that all together, you know. It was uh, more like going out with the Latinos. <laughs> I mean, to, you know, to have dinner in groups, of course, you know, uh, in groups and in discotheques. And uh, yeah, it was a fun area because it was, uh, we were in the late 70s. It was in the disco days in that period. And um, it's not like, it was not like today. Today, the tennis players are mm. in the company mm. with three, four people, which was not the case. I was alone. We were all alone. We could not afford to travel with a coach. Uh, we had a coach for the Fed Cup, of course, uh, who was accompanying us. Uh, but um, at the beginning, uh, no, no. When we went to, yeah, for the first time at, Roland Garros were juniors, yeah, we were in a group, so we had a coach. Uh, but uh, afterwards, when we were, you know, uh, by ourselves in each one's career, uh, we were alone. And so were the others. I mean, it was not like everybody had a personal coach and so. So that's why we were mixing uh, with the other players much, much more, much easier. And really, it was a, a, a fun, a fun uh, period. Yeah, but later, you, later, uh, later, you became manager I got yourself, right? Syria you became a manager. manager. Exactly. And uh, I, but when I won uh, Roland Garros in 1978, the only, the only people I had with me <clears throat> were my parents. I managed to get my parents uh, to come I managed to have a passport and visa for them. By then I started to go up, you know, and uh, we were lucky to have a, a president of, of the Romanian Federation who loved sports. And he started to let us go out a little bit more, more and more. He was giving us visa, the passport in the hand and visa to go. And of course, Ili and Tiriak being so big with, with the Davis Cup and so, I think they pushed the other generations up and tennis became pretty popular in Romania. And uh, so us, the following generation, we could uh, start, you know, to have the privilege to go outside uh, a little bit more than before. Okay. And, and, um, and later you became oh, well, manager, right? Yeah, you I yourself, tennis, manager. Uh, I was, 31. Actually, I had my daughter, uh, my, do my daughter Caroline, and then, oh. then I tried to make a little comeback, but it was, I was not, you know, during my pregnancy, I did not do anything. I mean, today, these girls, 
they come back after having a child. It's fantastic. I mean, yeah. I talked to Peneta. I saw her at Roland Garros uh, last year and she had three kids, you know, and but she kept coming back, you know, after the first one and so so. It's amazing. But uh, in those days, I, I remember Yvonne Goulagon came back, but she had the child early at 23. And, uh, and Margaret Court came back. She had three children yeah. and, and came back. And Margaret Court played very late. But uh, me, uh, at 30, mm. I think I was 30, not 30, 30, 31, something like that. I mean, I didn't do anything during my pregnancy. I mean, oof, didn't even think of going to the gym to maintain myself and, and, and something like that, nothing. And anyway, afterwards, I tried to come back. I did come back. And, and I remember I had a wild card at Roland Garros in the fall. My daughter was born in 86. And um, uh, in 87, I had uh, 87, yes. I had, uh, or, or 86, I don't remember if it was right after, six months after, I think it was, I had a wild card, which uh, Roland Garros gave me. And you know what? The first round, the player that I met was a Czech player called Skronska, who also became a mother, who also just had a child. Can you believe that? And I won the match. <laughs> so... The only two mothers <laughs> in that generation played each other at Roland Garros in the first round. <laughs> what a coincidence. Ooh, what a coincidence. So, and I won that match, and then uh, the second round, I lost a tough one to, to a good player, a Czech player. I lost a tough one. It was like a 7-5 in the third. And after that, I, I did not play Wimbledon. I tried to play a few other tournaments later on. But... I was not motivated anymore. And I decided to quit. Yeah. I quit in 87. And, and, and what, uh, what do you when, have done right you after? When, when, you, when, quit, when you stopped playing? What... I just quit like this. One day I was practicing. I was still trying, you know. I was practicing. And mm -hmm. I was practicing mm -hmm. with, 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 uh, with one of my sparring partners. And um, I was at the club of Tiriac and Vilas which is here in Paris, you know, they have a tennis oh. club. They used to have, and Sturza. It was called Vitis, from Vila, Styria, Sturza. Sturza was team, Sturza was also a tennis player. Uh, is prince, a Romanian prince who, who lived in Switzerland and played Davis Cup for Switzerland. And um, they built this club in Paris. And um, I was training at the club and... Uh, I was training with the main, main coach there. And uh, at one point I said, Francois, uh, I'm quitting tennis. Oh, so he goes, no, just Virginia, just sit down. I mean, look, it's okay. Just take, take your time, <laughs> sit down, relax a little bit, gather your strengths. So I said, Francois, listen, it's, I'm done. <laughs> I'm finished. I'm finished with tennis. Mm -hmm. And that was it. I guess I just physically, I was, I was not training in the gym. I was not, uh, and doing my pregnancy, nothing. And in those days, and you I lost, lost my motivation, you motivation because physically I, I did not work. Uh, and I was so tired all the time and I was not strong enough phys physically. And so you were not, not, you were not having fun anymore. As you say, I was not winning anymore. So I was not having fun anymore. And, and <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, you have fun in tennis uh, when you win? Uh, no, only? <laughs> not only in tennis. Well, you mean if I had, you know, if I have lived a, a, a fun life? That's what you mean? If I... No, oh. tennis for you, because I, I heard soccer, soccer players, former sports people said they didn't really enjoy, they enjoyed no, the I sport, enjoyed but tennis. they didn't, they no, suffered I, I enjoyed, during the competition. I enjoyed the competition. Let me I ask you this. Okay, this is, this no, is I, something I important I want you to no, talk for the young you players listening and the coaches. Uh, up there, I think, uh, if you are not a competitor. And, uh, yeah, I've been in the top 10, you know, for, for a few years, which uh, satisfy, satisfy, satisfies me uh, in a way. Uh, I know I probably could have done better, 
I don't want to have excuses, but I had a bad knee when I was 19. I torn my cruciate ligament and it, I was in Detroit. It was awful. Uh, and I then was out for, I don't know, three months. In those days, we did not operate it. I only got an operation for my meniscus, which was taken out. And uh, my ligament uh, cruciate could never come back. You know, it stayed lax like this. Mm. And so I had to work uh, to, to keep the strength of my muscles uh, in order to keep well my knee. But in spite of that, I still had, had about 13 twists of my knee in my career. Yes, a lot. Ooh. So each time I was wow. out for a month, two months, then I was working, come back on it. And so after, you know, at some stage, I decided, you know, to, 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 to give up. Yeah. Yeah, but when, how long after you quit, you started uh, your career? Oh, as first as a of all, yes, because you're coming back to your question. Uh, first of all, I was lucky because uh, my friend, uh, my very good friend, Betsy Nagelson, who became McCormick, uh, who married oh. Mark McCormick, through her and them, I, I, you know, we, I got to know Mark pretty well. And, you know, uh, each time he was coming to Paris or to London for tournaments or so, we were having dinners all together. And one day, he, he, the, yeah. he, he created he IMG, He was the boss right? of ING. He was the boss of, uh, of ING and he was yeah. the owner of ING. And married to Betsy Nagelson, who became mm. a cornic later on. And uh, uh, mm. each time we were going, you know, for dinners and so, we used to talk tennis and he loved to talk tennis and he loved tennis players and he absolutely loved the game, you know. And one day, after I gave birth to my daughter, we were having lunch, I remember, in Paris. Uh, and uh, I said, Mark, you know, what, what do you think? I didn't think of ING. I thought, Mark, what do you advise me to do? I need to do something. I just can't not do anything, you know. And he says, well, Virginia, you know what? I would be most happy if you would work for us. So I go, what? Mm. Yeah. You know, it would be really, a, a, you know, a pleasure and uh, it would be great if you accept. So, you know, I said, yeah, well, let, you know, let me think a little bit. And I thought about it. And, and a few days later, I called him and I said, Mark, I would like to take your offer. You know, so then I, uh, yeah, started to work for IMG. Yeah, I worked okay. about uh, almost five years, four years and a half, five years, something like that out of the uh, Paris office. I was between Paris and Monte Carlo. I was still a uh, resident in Monte Carlo. And so I was moving uh, between these two offices and I started to go to recruit. Uh, it was my job to start to recruit players from mainly from Eastern Europe and, and some in Europe, you know, but basically, but what, what is, Virginia, what ages, yeah, how well, old you were so, looking to uh, recruit? I have another funny story, amazing story. Uh, I don't know if you remember Chino Marchese. Do you know him by name? Chino Marchese yes. was a huge mm -hmm. manager. He discovered so many, many, many uh, young players at age 14, 15, something like that. He was going to those tournaments. Uh, okay, because he loved it. Yeah, I remember he went to the Orange Bowl and once I went also to the Orange Bowl. So that was under 14 or under 16. I don't remember. No, it was, it was under, under 16. And um, coming back to him, um, it was amazing because uh, he took me under his shoulder, you know, and we were going together to watch kids and so. And, and one day I received a call from a gentleman who uh, used to be the manager director of LSE in Italy. Uh, mm. And I used, 
to play with LSE. I was an LSE player until the end of my career. I started with Fila, but then I finished with LSE. And um, Poppy Vinti was his name. And he was the director also of the Italian Open in Perugia. So he knew me since I was playing in Perugia mm. already. And in Perugia, I played the two finals, if I remember well, against Chris Everett, that I lost them. One of them in three sets, but uh, you know, so uh, Poppy Vinti calls me and says, Virginia, I have seen this little Russian girl, 10 years old, and I he saw her at some, some tournament somewhere in America or in Europe, I don't remember. And he says, and I, I put her with Alessi, and uh, she, he, I would like you to come uh, to see her. Uh, here in Rome, because they were spending a lot of time in Italy, thanks to Poppy Vitti, Vinti, uh, Anna and her mother, Ala. So, he says, come and see her absolutely. So we are now, the 2nd of January, right after spending my uh, 31st uh, party, that I find myself in a plane, uh, before that, I, I called Chino and I said, Chino, please, we have to see this girl in the club uh, in, in, uh, in Rome. And um, we have to absolutely meet her and the mother. She's with the mother there. Apparently, she's very good. And Poppy Vinti asked me, so you have to come, please. So he says, Virginia, I'm so sick. I'm sick as a dog. But for you, I will come. <laughs> so okay, we meet at the club on the second of January, something second, second, yeah. And I'm I'm in the plane and I'm thinking, my God, what am I doing? Going to see an eight-year-old girl in, uh, you know, in Rome. <laughs> so I was kind of laughing of myself, you know. <laughs> so I arrive. I go directly to the club. Chino is uh, also there. The girl is already on the court. So after, you know, shaking hands with the mother and she had a coach who was an older lady, about 60. And I see Anna, you know, and I go, oh my God, she's good. She has everything. I'm looking, she's moving well. She had the good strokes. She had, she has, she has a good serve also. So with Chino, I said, Chino, we have to absolutely, uh, she was a, a, a marvelous kid, you know, happy afterwards on the court, you know. So, but I said, Chino, we have to take her. So we wait about uh, until she finishes the match. I don't remember if she won it or lost it. This I don't remember. But we are sitting down with the mother and, and the lady coach and Anna. So we want to explain to them that we want to sign her for ING and bring her to America, <clears throat> her and her mother, oh. to America at the Boletieri Academy. I'm talking, talking of course, about Anna, Anna Kurnikova. Kurnikova. And you know what? The other ladies did not understand the Iota, did not understand English, did not understand Italian. The one that was translating to the ladies was Anna because she spoke the little the, Anna at eight years and a half nah, at eight years and a half Anna. she understood what we meant because the, uh, nobody spoke English Anna spoke a little Italian because she spent some and uh, played some tournaments in Italy you know uh, thanks to Poppy Vinti uh, who actually sponsored her uh, in those days and so you know, we decide and we ask them to take them to the academy and they say, okay. And following, uh, we put them in contact with a guy from our office uh, in New York, for the ING office, you know, who spoke Russian and who was taking care of, of hockey players oh. Oh. that were playing uh, in, in, in America all over. So he could speak Russian. And so this way, uh, you know, he took over. And this way, Anna arrived. And, and this is exactly how you started. How, uh, Anna and I also started like that. 
<laughs> Isn't that amazing? What a story! Wow, what a story! What a story! It's, it's what a quite story. Amazing. amazing, amazing. Yeah. And so for amazing. Yes. And and yeah, fantastic. So uh, time flies. Uh, so I want to ask you a few questions, uh, Virginia, about um, yeah. Yeah. the tennis now. When you see the WTA now, WTA now compared with what when you played, tell us the be the. the what changes besides you know the, the 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 equipment the preparation the team that they have around when you watch the yeah. tennis matches now compared with the matches the Chris you Navratilova Virginia Wade well, then tell us what, well, what do you the, see the what difference is physical you know it's clear we were not having uh, in those days gyms uh, not going to uh, lift weights and to you know we would what we were doing for the physical condition was doing some sessions of sprints on the tennis court or go in a park and and do some jogging uh, you know i remember when when borg came to to romania uh, and the tennis club where we were practicing and so had had this uh, uh, soccer uh, soccer uh, court uh, and he was running uh, 20 laps around the soccer uh, around the soccer uh, court uh, field, the soccer field. And so uh, that's what we were doing, a little bit of, uh, um, you know, a little bit of uh, running, uh, sprints and endurance and uh, no lifting the weights and stuff like that. And, and the nutrition, oh, how the nutrition, nutrition was back in the uh, day? We were not, we were not <laughs> taking care of, you know, so much. Okay, everybody knew uh, what they liked best and, you know, maybe that they we should not eat heavy stuff before a match of course you cannot do that but um, uh. no i remember my favorites were were steaks i was eating steak uh, steaks every almost every mm. evening uh, of course pasta was always there Wa wa water, water? <laughs> a lot water? of water <laughs> and uh, and um, water. yeah the usual i mean personally i was not paying attention uh, you know, I was eating everything that I liked. Okay, before a match, you, would, you wouldn't do that. You know, you're not going to, you know, eat a big steak. And uh, we were careful and eating light food, you know, eat a sandwich and eat uh, some pasta. And so, so, but it was not like, a, uh, like I, I was taking care uh, to eat a special uh, uh, regime. Yeah, but... But now, what, what, now when you see the players yeah. traveling with so, coaches, who, who, physio, fitness, sports psychologists, yes, no, we managers, did, we did not have uh, what do you, uh, that opportunity because you know uh, when I, I, I know, no, but 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 my question, sorry, my question is, you're watching are, are yeah. all this entourage has made tennis better made or what? not so, necessarily has made it better the sport of tennis better tennis better sport, well, tennis, better uh, sport like uh, when you when you play well, or not listen i think that it made the players be more professional you know we were less professional in the sense that yeah you could go to a restaurant and stay a bit late before a match you could even go to to a discotheque you could you know you would mix you would mix much more and go have some fun and and you know have dinners together uh, okay, before matches, we were careful. Everybody was careful, but it was less, less professional in a way. Although we all wanted to be champions and we were champions, if you, if you see what I mean. Uh, you know, it was tennis and tennis and tennis. I remember I was practicing four hours a day, nevertheless. Uh, two, two hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon. But I was not putting extra hours in a gym. And at one point when I could afford it, I took a coach. I took a personal coach, but that was it. And mm -hmm. what we were doing mm -hmm. in our generation, if you remember, Borg had his parents with him. Vilas had his father a lot with him. Uh, I also brought my parents occasionally. And I had one coach, but not a physical preparator and a masseur and a kinetherapeut and all that. We were putting the name on a list in the dressing room for the massage, you know, 
there was oh. somebody who was doing massages for uh, hired by WTA, but we were in line. There was only one person. And so you had to put your name quickly. <laughs> yeah, how about... How about the sports no, never, psychologist? Never, never for me anyway. I don't know. Never. Maybe Navratilova might have had that. I don't know. I... And now, now seems to be that everybody well, has sports psychologist. I was not interested. Once I remember I had a guy that came up to me and he was a sports perhaps psychologist. And, you know, I, I, I told him, I'm so sorry, but I'm not interested. And, um, I was never, I never felt the need of a psychologist, you know. Um, I okay. thought that having a psychologist in those days means you're weak mentally, you see. And uh, I don't think the same way today uh, anymore. Uh, because, you know, the pressure maybe is, well, the pressure was always high and we all had to deal with the pressure. You know, the pressure of being, uh, for me, for example, mm. I was also one year in the finals of Roland Garros and I felt so much press. I wanted so badly to beat Chris that I totally, totally missed my match. So we do have pressure in any generation, you know, whether you have a psychologist with you or not. Look at Djokovic, the kind of pressure that he went through uh, during this tournament, this past tournament, and particularly in the finals. Why do you think he started to cry like this? I mean, he, it was the pressure that he had that came out at one point. Yeah. You know, so um, yeah. whether you have a psychologist or not, I think those that need a psychologist particularly are those that lose matches all the time uh, when they are ahead, but they don't manage to finish the matches and they lose. They lose it by fear of winning or by fear of losing or I don't know what else, you know. What a, okay, oh, what a great point. What is the difference between the fear of oh, winning and fear uh, of winning? The difference between losing and winning, you mean? No, no, the fear of winning and the fear of ah. losing, the difference. Uh, the fear of losing. <laughs> <a good> <laughs> you mentioned that. Um, yeah, yeah, let me think to give you the right, I hope I can give you a, a good answer. Um, the, the fear of losing is tougher to, uh, to take, I think, because you have something to lose. And the fear of losing, you have it particularly uh, when you play players that are lower ranked than you, I would say. But on the other side, you know uh. that you know that you beat them in the past that you are higher ranked, but nevertheless, and you have some particular players that were close to beat you, but and you managed, and yeah. then you fear some more than others. And also depending on their kind of game, whether they are big attackers or somebody that's very, very steady and doesn't give you anything. If you see what I mean, did I ex mm. express myself okay? And then uh, uh, the fear of losing, the fear of losing is definitely against somebody that is much, much less ranked than you, but has given you some trouble in the past. And also you don't want to lose a lot. You don't want to lose when you really play for your country, uh, like in, in Fed Cup uh, or for the men in Davis Cup. I think it's very tough, uh, you know, when you represent the country. I think it's much tougher than when you represent yourself. And so, and well, the feel, uh, the of, feel winning? of winning, the feel of winning is fantastic. The, ah, the fear. The fear, <laughs> the fear, fear. Of, of course, the feel of winning yeah. is fantastic. Um, the fear of winning yeah. is, is when you're up, you know, you are up, you're leading uh, in, in, the, in the match, you are up a uh, set and I don't know, 3-1, 4-2, something like that, and you're playing a, a, a better player generally than you, better ranked, and you're close to winning, or, or when, you have, when you have match points and, uh. and, 
you still lose it. For me, I call it fear of losing because all of a sudden you don't play the same. You don't play as loose, loose as when you got there, when you got to be in advance. And yeah, and I, I remember I lost a few matches having match points, but I also won a few matches where I, where I was down match point. Uh, uh, Virginia, how should be the mindset, the correct mindset for the player in those situations? Well, the mindset, the mindset, um, well, uh, look, sometimes, sometimes you manage to control the situation, uh, thinking that, look, you have to play point by point, particularly in those moments when you feel close to a victory. I think you have to forget the, the score. And, and you just tell yourself, now I have two more games to win and I have to play point by point and I don't think of the score. So if you manage to do that, you know, I guess, you know, it's a plus. But it's very hard to, it's very hard to, you know, you, it's very hard to forget that you are, you know, up and <laughs> to impose yourself to forget. Really, you have to stay in and to get double concentration, I think, when you're up and not 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 to lose more concentration you know, and say ah i'm almost i'm winning you know i'm winning no you have to be careful until the last point uh, virginia there yes. is a question for the audience uh, maria said do you think athletes should have the country flag when they play for themselves and not the country and if so no. why i liked it the way i had it and the way we still have it uh, I think that playing for the country puts more pressure for you, on you. Playing for yourself is easier. It's, um, you know, it's you, you are responsible. And if you lose, you are responsible for yourself. And this is it. And you're trying to do, you know, the best you can next time and so on. And you, you have this mentality and this speech to yourself. When you play for your country and particularly... Uh, in Davis Cup matches uh, and, you know, uh, and, and Fed Cup matches, it's, it's a different kind of a pressure. And, and, that, and that one to okay. me is harder to deal with than the one that you play for yourself. Virginia, Paul Forsett, great coach from IMG, exactly, ready to be saying hi. Uh, he coached who, so many great players. Who did, uh, Virginia, his name is Paul oh, oh. Forsyth. Yeah, he worked for, for Nick so ah, many years, 35 years for Nick. Oh, yes, yes. So, and? Yeah, yeah. So, Virginia, let me ask you this. Uh, if you have to give a girls an advice, right, to want to be pro, they want to be pro, what advice will you give it to them? For the let's say 16, 15, 17 years old, well, listening to this interview. Well, if they want to, to, to be pros, um, they have to give it all. They have to absolutely give it a try and um, not hesitate a second. I want to be a pro, then I'm going to be a pro. And um, you have to stay tough mentally. And of course, they have pressure even at 15, at 16, they are playing all these tournaments uh, in their age. And the pressure starts very early in tennis. And uh, yeah, you have to still deal with the pressure, um, particularly, particularly, yeah, in the Grand Slams. And even the juniors, if they are 15, 16, and they play juniors, there is also a pressure. Um, and um, yeah, uh, it's tough, but you know, players learn with time ever since they are small to deal with the pressure. You know, it's, it's, this pressure comes mm. from early ages. When you play the Orange Bowl and, and, and all other European championships and so, uh, you have to go through these developments and to become stronger by playing and going through situations in which you have to negotiate your, with your nerves and the stress. And okay, there are some that are stronger and there are some that are less stronger. That uh, so you think there is something you born with that mental toughness, or you I learn to be mental tough? 
a lot into yourself. I think you, it's born with it. I don't know. It depends also how you, what you, how you grow up, even when you are a child. Are you ambitious? Are Your you family. ambitious to be? Right? I was very ambitious to be number one at school, for example. Not that I want to, you know, praise myself or something. But this is true. I mean, my mother instigated into me the desire to be the best at school. So I had to be the best at school. <laughs> not, that, not that my parents following would put pressure on me or be angry with me or something like that. But I put that pressure on myself. And I dealt with it pretty well until I started to travel with tennis. And then tennis took over. And I was absent from the school more and more often going to play tournaments so now the pressure moved you see the, mm. the pressure moved I let down for my you know for the pressure in school and my pressure moved towards tennis and winning so first of all you, you have to have it in yourself yeah. uh, I guess that uh, and of course there are stronger ones and good ones and less good ones in that mental necessity and um, I would say that being strong mentally is very important I mean I don't I have not seen one Here, we have player, a... man or woman who is number one two three four winning grand slams that is not tough mentally this is my opinion exactly in Mada Popa perfect see another question sure. for the audience and thank you so much Uh, they said, uh, what do you think about parents that put a lot of pressure on young players? That's, uh, you. that's you know, that's negative for me. <laughs> that is uh, really a, a burden for the player. I mean, if the player likes tennis and feels that, you know, she or he can do it and be on the court and, and have enough energy and desire and they can control their emotions and all that uh, even if they lose sometimes I mean, you have to lose first before you learn you know how to win and how to get better you know it's very rare those that never 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 lose you know very very rare and uh, uh, the parents that put so much pressure on them I, I, I feel sorry for those players but it happened that Some of them succeeded a lot in spite of that pressure. There were many, many, many that had, like Mary Pierce, had a lot of pressure from her father particularly. Uh, you know, and I remember Mary. Jelena, 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 that was a Jelena Dokic. For, for, uh, Jelena Dokic. She re and she reached nevertheless yeah. number four in the world. I remember. But look mm. what happened in, in the end for her. Her career following was destroyed. Have you, have you watched the, the yes, movie, I The Venus, I did, I did. The Serena I did, Venus, the King Richard? What, what do you, what do you well, think it about it? It's a great movie. movie. I loved it. And, the, you know, apparently I was an inspiration for Mr. Williams. And I thank him forever. I mean, it's amazing. He made me, you know, he made me a bit famous because of that. Apparently, I don't know. I, you, so you you saw the movie or not? Did did you did you yeah. see it from the beginning? What yes, how it starts? So apparently yes, yeah. Apparently he yes, saw but... me win a tournament and win a big check, and then decided to have two kids and make them tennis players. So you know, you know he this is the story. Probably you missed out on it. I don't know. Maybe you yeah. missed it out. It's right at the beginning of the movie. No, ah, no, you did. No, oh, okay, I watched okay. everything. I watched the movie. I watched it three, three times. Three times. So, three times. So what can I say? When I saw, I yeah. met him, uh, you know, so, and uh, uh, right after that, it was amazing because uh, I was working for IMG when I heard the story. And a colleague of mine from New York calls me and he says, uh, Ruzici, because he used to call me Ruzici. You are all over the news. And I go, yeah, what, what's yeah. happening? Are you crazy? What, me? <laughs> and he goes, well, Mr. Williams is saying all over all over the, the press that he, uh, you know, watched you play and so decided to have two more kids and, 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 and to, to, to make them tennis players. And I thought, what? You know, I mean, it was, you know, I mean, and, uh, 
Then I met him at Wimbledon the first time, the first year when Venus won, won Wimbledon. And he was on the terrace and I, I went to him and I said, uh, you know, I introduced myself and he gave me a big hug, a big, big hug and introduced me to Venus. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's something that just, you know, I'm lucky, I guess. <laughs> Because yeah. it made me so me much you, Virginia, because of that. Uh, I mean, it's, you know. Yeah. Let, let me ask you, let me ask you this, please. Uh, everybody says that Rafael Nadal and Novak Djokovic have the best mind. Uh, uh, Rafa right, and Nadal. In, uh, among tennis players. Uh, Rafa yes, and course. Novak. Both. But let me ask you, uh, which a female player was according equal, to you was equal to have that. or had or yeah, the well, best mind Chris Everett, first of all Chris Everett, uh, Chris Everett you know 18 grand slams also Martina has 18 grand slams how about Serena Serena Williams Serena is amazing. Serena is the one that, you know, uh, is first of all up there, you know, so strong, so, so strong mentally, you know. Uh, actually, uh, I'm trying to think, okay, Chris ever because, you know, I thought of Chris first of all because it was my, Steffi, was my generation. Steffi Graf. Uh, then going back, of course, all number ones, all number ones have, all number ones, all number men ones. and women. Uh, But even, even, Uh, even number, number one, one for one week. One week. That's different a little bit. That's different. No, but the big number ones, you know, that stayed up there for, yeah, the, the big, big number one. ones. Uh, Borg was enormous also. Enormous. He was so, so strong mentally. And, and, uh, but uh, he, he, at one point, he just couldn't take that pressure anymore and quit early. I probably, I, probably that's why he quit early. Because he felt that he just couldn't do it anymore. After winning, uh, you know, six mm -hmm. Roland Garros and, and five Wimbledons, uh, that was it for him. So, Connors, great competitor, great competitor, great competitor Ginny Connors. Uh, Ginny Connors, of course, of course, you know them. So you put, put you put Ginny Connors the same level as Rafael Nadal from the mental point of view. Or uh, not? He, this, you know, you're putting me some hard questions there. <laughs> You know, how can you, how can you not put Nadal uh, up there as number one with, with, with Djokovic when, when winning uh, 22 Grand Slams? How many did Jimmy win? Uh, 18. 18. Uh, eight, 18, uh, I think. 8 or, eight eight or, or 19. 18 or 19. So Jimmy also. Uh, but, no, yeah. no, no, no. Jimmy, Jimmy Connors. No, no. Eight. That's all? 8 or 9. Oh, I'm yes. sorry. I may, I'm making a confusion there. Yeah. No, because Sampras uh, won yes, 14. Exactly. Pizza. He, what am I talking about? Jimmy, Jimmy won, I can tell you right now. Uh, he won uh, one, two, three, yeah, four, yeah, five, six, right. eight, eight, eight grand slams. Yeah, sorry about that. No, but in spite of all this, He was very, very, no, very I... tough, Jimmy. But still, I would put Nadal and, and Djokovic up there with, 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 uh, with, the and with Federer, Serena Roger. and, um, and um, uh, yeah, who else uh, in those days? Serena and Steffi Graf. Mm -hmm. Steffi Graf also. And, and I you think said, Chris Evans, you said Chris Evans, right? Martina is a li was much more emotional. You know, and uh, some sometimes you could see that uh, into her game uh, more than you would see in Chris's game or or you know the others, and but also strong because you know to to win so many titles, so it's hard to say which one absolutely mm -hmm. only one who was the best. I mean, it's been a bunch of them. Um, I think Margaret Court also must have been very strong mentally because you know she. She won 24 Grand Slams, right? So I yes, remember I 24. played her. I played Margaret Court. And I was... I, I was... Wow. I tell you what, what I, a, what I, I was up uh, a set and five tours or five two in the third or something like that. And I lost the match. I lost seven five in the third. But Ooh. she was at the end of her nice. career. So anyway. Um, 
sometimes you can be very, very, very tough on the match point, but it doesn't necessarily depend only on you. It also depends on the opponent, how tough he is or she. Exactly. Somebody in the audience is asking about uh, what do you think about Simona's Halep chances to come back and play in the near future? Simona That's is the practicing. You know, she's practicing these days and, and ready to come back as soon as possible. As soon as possible. Perfect. And uh, <clears throat> we cross the fingers that this is going to be very fast because she's innocent. Perfect. Perfect. So, so is, is, she is yes. motivated. She's she training is. hard. Again. Yeah. Good. I bet she was excited watching Australia, right? Saying, oh, <laughs> I can be there. <laughs> uh, right? I, 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 I don't know if she watched uh, a lot or not. Uh, I, I don't know. Okay. I know she was practicing in Dubai pretty hard uh, just before the Perfect. Australian Open. And, and I think she continues to practice hard and, and be ready and waiting for, for the decisions, you know. Yeah. Perfect. And a couple more questions. And I want to ask you, uh, uh, what are you doing now? What is, how is your life? Why are you in Paris? Are you yes, living permanent, permanent in Paris? Permanent in Paris France? for 40. No, I lived in... Okay. I, 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 what do you do? How, well, listen, I, do? I worked for with Simona for 14 years. So that I was her manager for 14 years. And uh, that gives you a lot to do, you know. And uh, I have tra been traveling in the last... Uh, uh, 14 years, uh, with the exception of the COVID period, uh, quite a lot, you know, uh, mainly in the Grand Slams and a few times going to Romania for assisting Simona in things that she had to do for our sponsors over there and organizing things. Uh, since April, I'm not her agent anymore, so I, I have more free time for myself. <laughs> um, uh, and... Um, I'm not traveling anymore, anymore, uh, anymore so much. I am just, I just have been to London uh, for Wimbledon in terms of tournaments. But you know, I am a married woman. I have a child, a daughter, and I have a granddaughter. <laughs> so, uh, how well, old? How old is she? Thirty-six, and the uh, and the no, little you're, one you're is one right. year and four months or five months, something. Yes. Oh, and, and, and are you, you, you going <laughs> to teach her tennis? I don't know. I don't know, but she likes the tennis ball. She's playing a lot with the tennis ball. And uh, when we do videos, she shows me the tennis ball, like, just like you did. It's amazing. She recognizes mm -hmm. me because, you know, I play with her a little bit. I throw her the tennis ball. So, yeah, so she kind of recognizes me and connects me with the tennis ball. That's amazing, no? So I don't know. I yes let me let me yeah i have a question for and you as a tennis coach, coach i have never i have uh, never been if a you tennis come coach. to my account oh okay but i have a question me as a tennis coach me uh, if you come to my place to my academy and which let's say i'm teaching little girls which one will attract you more the one who hits the ball fast hard or the one who controls oh the ball it depends it's that's not the only reason uh, you have to look at it all together the way she, well, what, what do you look what do you look, I, I, you, what I do look, you look at the way they move first of all the way they run on court you have to be movement to really be at the top you have to be a very good athlete you have to be fast you have to have a good eye you have to be fast, fast. and have a good eye and then uh, what means what means for the people who doesn't to see the ball to early, good eye? to anticipate well and early yeah i think so and then okay this is something that we can you, you can, can teach improve right? things you can teach, teach. You, you can improve things but it's better to have it naturally it's better to oh, have okay. it naturally it's better to be a fast player from early ages than to be obliged to work so much more on your speed, you know. Um, natural athletes uh, are basically born with, with some qualities of, a, of an athlete. Uh, now, tennis has changed compared to my generation because these girls are much taller also and much stronger physically. When, 
when you look yes. at them. And tennis has also changed because uh, everybody tries to hit uh, as hard as, as possible, particularly in women's tennis. And um, yeah, and in, from the tactical point of view, when everybody's trying to... Well, Virginia, yeah. give me one second. Yes. I, know, I took notes, I'm taking notes, you said. Yes. Fast, they have to be an athlete. You said they have good to have eye. a good eye, anticipation and, and, to see the ball early. And, and, the, and the tough mind, what else? A, good, a good mind. To know, to, you know, to, to know how to negotiate uh, every time when you play a match, you, you have to be strong mentally in the same time as the other qualities in order to win the match. I mean, if you're weak mentally um, and let's say you are up all the time and you keep losing matches, it's going to be much harder, you know. So it's, it's going to be, uh, you know, having to take, you know, a mentor, uh, a psychologist and stuff like that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which could help somehow. But I think that you can become tougher with time also. Uh, and you can, you know, take Mary Pierce, for example. Mary Pierce was not the fastest player in the world. You know, she, she, she was not yes. a, a Steffi Graf or, a, you know, or, a, or Justine Henin or, or some, somebody like that, you know. Um, mm. So she had to work on her speed. And she worked very hard on her speed, but she had a good eye. She had a very, very good eye. She saw the ball early. And she had a very good technique and, and, a, and a fast arm and, and a lot of power. So she could compensate. But she also worked very, very hard, you know, to become a, uh, you know, to become a faster player. And, and in the end, she, she won, you know, uh, Roland Garros and played a couple other finals and so. And, and, and she was, you know, yeah. I think number three in the world or something like that. So you have to have a lot of ambition, a lot of qualities. And first of all, you have to, to like the game. You have to like to be on the court and not to be afraid, yeah. you know, uh, on the court of, of losing. You know, you, you have to go there to, you know, take Coco Goff. Coco Goff <clears throat> is an example for me. He's a young player who is very solid mentally, you know, who, who is intelligent. Yes. Uh, you, you, you can see that she has a tactic. Uh, you can see that she's uh, trying to improve st steadily, you know. She has no lows. She's there and going up. Yes. Uh, maybe not as fast as Steffi Graf or Monica Seles and, and those other players at Capriati. And so, because uh, she's now 19, but she is improving steadily. And I think she has a very, very good mind on the court. She's trying to construct the point. You know, she's playing right. Um, and she's not, you know, giving points, free points and, and, and things like that. So she's solid mentally. And, and you know, she's going to succeed to be up there, I think. So you see her like a oh, future, number, future one. number one. It's very hard to say. Future number one. Future number one for okay. the moment I see... Ribakina, for example, Ribakina, Ribakina Riba. is uh, to me unbelievable. She has such a technique. She plays so. Of you, course, you, you watch of the course, finals. Of course, the, the, don't the, forget the, that she's the only why, one. Why? She's the uh, only one why? 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 in this tournament, uh, in, in the Australian Open, and Siatek mm -hmm. is is amazing in the last in the last couple of years. Very very tough to beat her. And uh, Siatek yeah. is probably less uh, uh, performant on grass, but as far as clay and, uh, and hard courts, I mean, she's very hard to beat. So Ribakina beats Siatek. Uh, I saw her beat Simona uh, Halep uh, at Wimbledon in the semifinals uh, last year. Uh, uh, and I was impressed because before that, I kind of didn't see her so much. And that's the first time when I was so impressed, I thought, mm. she's playing so easy. She's not forcing her strokes and she's playing so deep. Technically, she's complete, complete, totally complete. She has very pure strokes. Uh, no, you know, variation, simple and pure and uh, light on the feet, although she's tall, because usually the taller players have a harder uh, a time, you know, changing directions and, and, and moving fast on the court, but she is. I mean, she has 
absolutely everything to be number one in the world. This is what I think. But why she lost well, to she Sabalenka lost in the Sabalenka final? Because, first of all, Sabalenka played the best match of her career. Uh, she uh, did not get uh, on the court out there in the finals uh, being too impressed. Uh, because now she has some experience, Sabalenka. She's won a lot of matches. You know, she's been up there for a while. So she managed to have some experience. And I think she was ready for this final. Although she lost the first set because Ribakina, you know, did not give her any chances, I would say. Um, and, but then she didn't give up. She got so remotivated remo immediately in the second set and started to put more and more pressure, started to hit harder and harder. And Rybakina, it was enough that she hesitated a little bit in the middle of the set and made some mistakes. And uh, I felt, and you know, I looked at her face, maybe she, she, you know, started to feel a little pressure or something happened that she, her game, it was enough that a little bit gets a little bit down and then Zabalenka popped in stronger and then she, you know, she, in the third set, she was unbelievable. She was unbelievable and she, yeah. You know, deserve to win, deserve to win. But Ribakina, I think she has an unbelievable potential. She's so complete. Uh, yeah, maybe she felt some pressure at one point, uh, Ribakina, a little bit. At Wimbledon, she did yeah. not feel yeah. any pressure yeah. at all. Yeah. But then she felt some pressure in the middle of the second yeah. set. And, yeah. you know, finally, maybe that's what cost it. Because if she stays strong, you know, in that second set and doesn't give a chance, to Zabalenka to come back and to take initiative and so, but you know there we are. Zabalenka is champion of Australian and congratulations we, to we, her. Now we will yeah. see. Sorry. We, we will see now. So no, the next think, three Grand Slams. Thank you Virginia, so much. Also. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you, Daniel. Thank you for your time. It was fantastic. So many great stories. And uh, and I love it. I, as a tennis coach, Thank I you love so much for inviting stories. me. Thank you. All the best, and we stay in touch. I hope that you had a, you bye had bye a good. To, I hope you had a good time. You know, all your followers. No, no, thanks. But I, I hope had a you great had a time. good time. Thank you very much. Really, see, I have to smile. Thank <laughs> you. And this is the ball. Go to your side. Catch. Ciao. It. All the best. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. I see you. Ciao. The same. Stay in touch. Bye-bye.